Hello everyone! As 2023 comes to an end, I'd like to wrap up the year in throwback Weaselberry fashion with a Jane Eyre video. It's only fair, I've done several Godzilla-related videos in the past month, so... Gotta do this too to keep things balanced! I don't have one adaptation to talk about in full today. This is a video commenting on a few odds and ends that have been brought to my attention recently. First up, one of my viewers, who is a passionate devotee of the 1973 version, directed me a few months ago to a recording of an interview conducted by the Bronte Parsonage with Sirica Cusack and Michael Jaston, the stars of that adaptation, celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. It was done as a Zoom call where fans could join in and contribute comments and questions in the chat. I did not know about it at the time, uh, which is kind of a bummer, but I know myself, and I'm sure that if I had been aware of it, I would have been too shy to participate. That's just how things go. I am not a joiner, I am not a big participator, I am a wallflower. <laughs> so I can't really lament not being able to be part of something that I probably would have shied away from anyway. Someone graciously uploaded the audio of the discussion to YouTube so that all of us wallflowers and people who couldn't participate during the event itself could still hear it, and it's delightful. An hour-long chat as the stars reminisce and josh around with each other. They are self-deprecating and full of good humor and mutual admiration. They make jokes about her name, which is how I learned that I have been mispronouncing it this whole time. It's Surika, not Sorsha. And he jokes about his age, and his little fan club, and the ages of his fans, which I must say I think he's too modest about. They share their thoughts on the book, on Charlotte Bronte, on the on-screen chemistry between their characters. Cusack talks about her costumes, and Jason talks about his wig, <laughs> and the dog that played Pilot. He seems to remember more about the filming than she does, and that leads to a lot of funny stories, especially one about the proposal scene and how they kept getting interrupted by an ice cream truck and they had to film it six or seven times and he was going out of his mind. <laughs> the whole thing is a treat for those of us who love that adaptation, especially to hear their appreciation for the work, for each other, and for the other performers. There are a few things said that may be surprising for some fans. Unlike us, they have not made it a mission to watch every adaptation of Jane Eyre. They haven't seen any of the ones that came out after theirs, and before that they only saw the Orson Welles and Joan Fontaine one. And I was a little bit surprised that he said, uh, well, what everybody remembers from that film is the conflagration at the end. And I feel like, what? <laughs> They've never watched their own version again, and it sounds like that's not something they would be interested in doing it. They just want to keep those memories intact. But I think that's fairly typical of most actors. So it's a fun chat to listen to, and I think it's great that they were both willing and able to come together and do that for the fans. I have put a link to the video in the description for anyone else who wants to give it a listen. Next up, a couple viewers have let me know within the last few weeks that yet another obscure TV version from the 60s has surfaced. This one is a six-episode adaptation produced by the BBC in 1963 that stars Anne Bell and Richard Leach. I knew this version existed, but I figured I would never come across it anywhere, so to suddenly learn it was on YouTube was a shock. <laughs> I have no idea how the uploader got a hold of it. It's the kind of thing where I feel like I'm not asking questions. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is not complete. Episodes 2 and 3 are missing, so you've got Jane's childhood through her departure for Thornfield, and then all of a sudden it jumps forward to Jane telling Mrs. Fairfax that she is engaged to marry Mr. Rochester a lot of favorite scenes are lost. 
And it's a real shame because from what we are able to see, it seems a safe bet that episodes two and three would have been pretty good. Because it is incomplete, I don't feel comfortable doing a whole review, but I will share some thoughts. The adaptation is quite faithful, except where it isn't. <laughs> that might not make sense, but what I mean is that in it includes a lot of details and little things that don't typically make the cut in feature film adaptations. But, on the other hand, there are some things left out and some things added that are interesting. Certain scenes seem inspired by the 44 Orson Welles and Joan Fontaine version, like the look and behavior of young Jane and the dispute between Mr. Brocklehurst and older Jane over her working at Lowood. I think young Jane looks older than 10 years old, but she does a good job, especially in her nonverbal moments. She's not quite as convincing when it comes to delivering lines, but she's still better than some other young Janes. In the Red Room scene and in her scene with Mrs. Reed, she's great. It was the scenes where she talks to Helen that I felt like it kind of was a bit rough. Noteworthy changes early on include young Jane snapping at Brocklehurst when he chastises Helen for coughing, and then Helen tries to intervene on Jane's behalf and ends up collapsing. That whole segment was far more dramatic. I do miss Helen's moral counsel. She is shown as Jane's best and only friend. But there's no deathbed wisdom about forbearance and forgiving your enemies, lessons which young Jane is supposed to bristle at before she learns to embrace them in adulthood. I was very impressed with Anne Bell's Jane. She appears to be the right age, even though she's a few years older. Um, she's got that Quakerish style. She's not ugly or plain, but she's not a glamorous movie star pretending to be plain and doing a poor job hoodwinking the audience. She's a natural in the role, and I liked her a lot. Her Jane is independent and unafraid to speak her mind, but she's not overly disrespectful. As for Richard Leach's Rochester, I find it harder to express an opinion because so much of the stuff that introduces and develops his character is missing. It's such a pity that we don't get to see his more playful or romantic moments because that's the stuff that, if played right, endears me to the character. The Rochester we do have is often curt impatient and brusque. It's an accurate portrayal to a degree, and as far as some people are concerned, that's Rochester spot on. But those aren't the aspects of the character that I like, <laughs> so I don't watch this and think, oh wow, he's an amazing Rochester. The character is more complex than just grumpy Mr. Moody Boots, you know? <laughs> There is nothing soft about this barky Rochester, and there shouldn't be. I just wish there was the other stuff for contrast. He does fine in the major scenes in the second half of the story, but I don't take that as a guarantee that his performance earlier on must have been just as good, because I can think of other Rochesters, Colin Clive, Kieran Hines, who were wonderful in the reunion but who totally missed the mark in some earlier scenes. Therefore, I am loath to jump to conclusions about Leech's Rochester in episodes 2 and 3 based on what I see from him here. I was pleasantly surprised by how much time they gave to the Veil scene and its follow-up, and they did a very good job including the Rivers family and Rosamond Oliver, fleshing out those characters nicely without making this section feel dull or drawn out. They do show what happens to Rochester in Jane's absence, as several other adaptations have done, and they show him after, when Briggs comes to Ferndean on some business and offers to give him Jane's current address, and he refuses to take it. 
Uh, that was interesting. Sinjin isn't bad looking. Uh, he's supposed to be more handsome than Rochester, and in this case, maybe he is. He's not friendly, but he's not a bad guy. Until he starts to act like a jerk, trying to open Jane's mail and accusing her of secretly corresponding with Rochester. He got pretty icky then. And uh, after that, the series wraps up pretty quickly with a touching reunion, uh, the highlight of which is a moment where Jane leaves the room and Rochester panics, thinking that she has abandoned him. So, like I said, what we have here is good stuff. And when I was finished, I was even more disappointed than I had been before that a whole 50 minutes of material is missing and apparently lost forever. I suppose it's possible that the missing episodes could show up in someone's attic someday. It doesn't seem likely, but you never know. Crazy things happen. I noticed that the YouTube channel that uploaded these episodes has also posted a few clips from the rare 1956 BBC version that stars Daphne Slater and Stanley Baker. So I checked those out. It took me all of six minutes. <laughs> it's just a couple rough clips and a segment taken from a documentary that shows a decent amount of footage and also has some very snarky commentary. If you want to see the whole adaptation, you have to go to England and see it on file somewhere. The BFI, I think someone said. That is too much of a hike for me! So I appreciate being able to see at least a couple minutes and get a taste of what it's like. It's really not enough to form any sort of opinion. If I couldn't form an opinion about um, Anne Bell and Richard Leach's performances from the two hours of footage that we had there, I certainly can't form an opinion of Daphne Slater and Stanley Baker from six minutes. Uh, but I will say the clips of Stanley Baker's performance are promising, and it seems Daphne Slater plays both young Jane and adult Jane. That's cool. I wonder how convincing she is. And that's all I can say about this adaptation. I could make a few more observations, but it just doesn't feel right, uh, given that the clips are so short and they are out of context, so I will refrain. I also was informed that the 1971 Spanish adaptation has shown up on YouTube. It's been posted by the same person. I have wanted to see this for a long time. I already had access to it on a different website, but it didn't have subtitles. And even though I do understand some Spanish, more Spanish than any other language, um, I have put off watching it for a couple years. I was hoping that someday somebody would post it with subtitles, and that's basically what has happened. If you watch the videos on YouTube, you can turn on English closed captioning, and they've provided a pretty good translation. I think? I don't know, I haven't watched it yet. If I get a chance to watch it before I post this video, I will come on right now and tell you what I think of it. Okay, so I watched the 1971 Spanish Jane Eyre, and you know what? It's pretty good! This adaptation stars Maria Luisa Merlo and Rafael Arcos, and it has 15 episodes total, which you can watch in a playlist on the channel Mr. Rochester Fan 2. Each episode varies a little bit in length, but they average about 20 to 25 minutes long, not including the introductory titles and the end titles. And I would say it's one of the most faithful foreign language adaptations out there. Except where it isn't. <laughs> it actually makes some serious deviations in the last part which threw me for a loop, but not in a bad way. The recording is not the best quality, the picture has a couple iffy moments, and if you're listening with headphones you'll probably pick up on some occasional background noise. I heard a distant siren at one point. And the closed captions, yikes, 
If you don't understand any Spanish and you are relying on the closed captions to understand what they're saying, it's not going to go well. <laughs> it's okay, but I was pretty disappointed in the translation there. There's no punctuation, no demarcation of who is speaking which lines. There's occasionally a delay on the last word of a sentence, and I know enough Spanish to have been able to pick up on that, so I'd be like, are you guys gonna finish with that, or just gonna leave us hanging? Oh, there it is, okay. And some things were just plain wrong. Mr. Brocklehurst, I'm not sure what they were calling him in this adaptation because the captions gave us Mr. Blue and Mr. Blood. I don't think they ever got Thornfield right. They usually just put up a cluster of consonants like THFR, uh, and the third person singular pronouns were a mess. The captions were eternally struggling to figure out she, he, and the formal usted. Sometimes they got it right. A lot of times, though, it was just... <sighs> it was so complicated, I considered turning the captions off and just doing my best with the Spanish, uh, which is pretty clear. Um, I could understand their Spanish quite well, uh, except for all the words that I just don't know, because I never learned them in my Spanish classes. I wouldn't. Um, but that's where familiarity with the story and the text comes in handy. I will say this is Spain Spanish, so there's a lot of the th sound, a lot of C's that are said with a TH noise. Um, if you're not used to that, it can be... A little tricky to follow along. So that's the biggest downside. I had to concentrate very hard to understand the dialogue. I was straining my ears and brushing off my very dusty Spanish while using the captions as a questionable crutch. But if you can manage to get past that, it is an adaptation that's worth watching. It's got some good performances, some nice moments, and unique takes on significant scenes. This is a longer adaptation, partly because it moves at a slower pace, and partly because they added some random extra stuff, like Mrs. Reed visiting Miss Temple, Jane's uncle coming to Lowood to see Jane only to tell her that he can't take her away with him, which I thought was kind of cruel. <laughs> There's a scene where a priest shows up at Thornfield for a chat or something. I didn't catch the point of that. And there's something about Rochester insisting on black roses. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be an expensive production. The sets are relatively simple. There are no authentic outdoor scenes. Establishing shots are just inserted stills. There is a very small group of students at Lowood. The costumes are uninspiring and very... 1971. I found it odd how often Rochester goes around wearing his dressing gown over his clothes, uh, but Jane also is, with some frequency, going around in her nightgown and dressing gown. Probably because it's very feminine and flowy and it looks nice, but um, it's not professional <laughs> and it it doesn't really make sense. Um, she's constantly putting it on, taking it off, putting it on, taking it off. There are so many times where she gets up in the middle of the night and starts walking around. And the weirdest instance of all of this is when Mason is attacked. Instead of her being intuitive and getting ready in anticipation of Rochester coming to her door and asking for help, she goes back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and then Rochester comes to the door, and she puts the dressing gown on and lets him in, and he tells her to get dressed, so she starts changing, while he just stands there with his back turned. And I was like, leave the room, man, come on! 
The adaptation follows the book's model, with adult Jane recounting her life story to the audience, and that was fine, although the narration did have a self-pitying, almost fatalistic quality. <laughs> no wonder some people think Jane Eyre is depressing. I wasn't a fan of young Jane. Not that she's bad, but she really dragged out some of her emotional scenes. There are a couple moments where we're just zoomed in on her face while she's emoting, and I don't know, I just, I didn't like her that much. Grown-up Jane, played by Maria Luisa Merlo, was better, and I liked her more as the show progressed. She does have a tendency to wear her heart on her sleeve, and I prefer to see Jane endeavoring to tamp down her feelings that way, when she's pushed too far and she can't contain herself anymore and things just come bursting out, it's more effective, it's more passionate, it's more intense and impactful. This is a very pious Jane. They make a point of showing her on her knees praying several times. She's in a chapel when she meets Rochester. That was another weird thing. No horse scene, which is okay. It's fine if they couldn't get a horse, they couldn't find a hay lane somewhere. But this chapel scene, he reaches out to her to take a rose that's pinned on her cape. She thinks he's being fresh and slaps him. <laughs> it's all very unusual and made him seem like kind of a creep. And then, I didn't like how they played the Do You Find Me Handsome dialogue, so we got off to a bumpy start with Rochester, but he also improved over time, and the actors are very good together. They have nice chemistry as things get more romantic. There's no kissing, though. Um, that's a funny thing I noticed. Hugs? Yes. Kisses on the cheek? Yes. But whenever he goes for it, she evades him in a playful way. I would say they're going for a purity thing here, um, but even at the end, there's no kiss. That's fine. <laughs> I think they did a very good job emphasizing the bond between Jane and Adele. There's a scene where Jane explains to her that she'll have to leave when Rochester marries Blanche, and Adele gets upset, but then she shows Jane how much she has learned from her, I guess, by giving an oral report on Gibraltar. And I realize that sounds totally bizarre, but it works in context. I liked their build-up to Bertha, which started early on. Jane hears noises and laughter when she's having tea with Mrs. Fairfax, and then we see a menacing arm at one point, and Jane spots Bertha in a window. Bertha does cackle kind of like a deranged chicken, but I thought her scenes were very good. The veil scene was excellent. Very spooky and atmospheric, um, as was the scene where Jane sits with Mason. They play some loud, whispering voices in the background when it's a Bertha scene, and that was very unnerving. I liked it. Mostly the soundtrack consists of a few excerpts from Rachmaninoff's second symphony, the third movement. I'm a fan of that, so no complaints here, although the integration could have been a little smoother. <laughs> they also toss in the Dies Irae whenever someone is dying. That was an interesting twist, kind of dark, while I found the fire scene in Rochester's room kind of underwhelming, I did like how they did the scene where Jane leaves the party, the scene where Rochester gives her money for her trip. <laughs> he asks, how do you say goodbye? And she says, por ejemplo, hasta la vista. <laughs> and I couldn't help saying, baby. <laughs> I liked the scenes with Mrs. Reed, the proposal scene, the morning after the proposal scene, the post-wedding scene. These were all very nicely done. There's also a lot more material with Grace Poole, including some stuff at the end, as I mentioned, which was very unexpected. But 
it was so fresh and different that I kind of liked the drastic change. And there is one scene that was so well acted that I couldn't fault the adaptation for doing away with an entire section of the novel. So while this took a lot more work to watch and comprehend, and therefore it was harder to get into, I ended up enjoying it, especially the second half, and I've come away with a pretty high opinion of it as an alternative adaptation. Many thanks goes to whoever runs these two channels, Mr. Rochester Fan and Mr. Rochester Fan 2, for Putting these videos up for all of us to see, I am extremely grateful and I appreciate uh, the generosity in sharing these things. I hope that you don't have any copyright issues from uploading all this stuff. Um, that is partly why I felt like I need to watch all these videos and make a video about them as soon as possible because you never know when they might disappear. <laughs> so for the time being, these videos are available on these two channels, and if you have any interest in either, in any of them, uh, you should check them out pronto. Lastly, I do have one more adaptation I want to comment on today, and it couldn't be more different. <laughs> there are a few recordings on YouTube of live theatrical performances of play versions of Jane Eyre. These range from not great to okay. Recently, one of my viewers, Hello Joy, referred me to one play that's a little out of the ordinary. It was a 2004 production put on by a theater group called Odd Socks Comms, and that's the name of the channel where you can watch a filmed performance of their Jane Eyre. And what makes it unusual is that this Jane Eyre is a comedy. Now, whenever I hear that, I don't necessarily have a positive reaction. I can't say I enjoy it when something I love seriously is made fun of in a mean-spirited way. I'm not saying that you can't have fun with Jane Eyre. I do. I do all the time. Um, but there's a line for me. And before anybody asks, because I've been asked about this enough and I don't want to hear about it anymore, <laughs> yes, I have seen Jane Eyrehead, and no, I don't like it. This comedic interpretation, however, works. It's not so much a parody or a spoof, it's more of a panto. I'm not sure how to describe what a panto is, because I'm not British, and it's a very British thing, and until a few years ago I had never heard of it, and so I'm not 100% sure how to define it. I understand it to be a performance of a serious play where the production itself is played for laughs, and the audience is encouraged to participate by being vocal and interacting with the actors, booing and hissing at the villain, cheering when something good happens, that kind of thing. I didn't see anything that said this was an official panto, but it sure seemed like one to me. <laughs> the play has two acts, each about an hour long, and they have been posted in two separate videos. The video itself is surprisingly well filmed, with different camera angles, close-ups, and some good editing. The only flaw is that the audio is a little uneven sometimes. I wasn't able to understand every line, which stinks when the audience bursts out laughing and you don't know why. Being first and foremost a comedy, there's slapstick, exaggerated accents and costumes, a ramshackle but creative set, a running gag with the fake stares that has a hilarious payoff in the end. What's crazy is that, as an adaptation, it's amazingly faithful to the novel. It does skip or combine some scenes, and there's no Helen at all. But all in all, the script follows the book very closely. Much closer than some of the other adaptations I have covered. Yet at the same time, there are all these bits of comedy in between the lines. It shouldn't work, but it does! <laughs> 
Now, for diehard Jane Eyre fans, it's probably an acquired taste. I sure didn't think it would be my cup of tea, <laughs> but I gave it a chance, and it was funny! I laughed several times, and then for me, the saving grace is that while they're having fun and being silly and excessive and all of that, it doesn't ever feel like they're making a mockery of Jane Eyre. They aren't being malicious or insulting. <sighs> okay, yes, there are moments when Jane makes these exaggerated facial expressions. It's pretty much after Rochester says, uh, you look puzzled and a puzzled air becomes you, and she just makes this just insane face. <laughs> and so then she makes that face every time something weird is going on. Um, so there's that, and she's a trifle obtuse when it comes to certain things, and given that I've always admired the character for her intelligence, maturity, composure, conviction, and fortitude, it bugs me whenever anyone portrays her as a naive, noodle-headed ninny. And there is some of that. But there are moments when the panto fades into the background, and the lead actors deliver their dialogue with the utmost sincerity. They get to the heart of the story without sarcasm or irony or a hint of ridicule, and that puts the production on another level. It's not just Jane Eyre, but it's silly. It's Jane Eyre, but it's silly, but there are moments where they do take it seriously, where they play it straight and that really makes it for me. There are only five actors involved, with three of them playing many characters, which adds greatly to the hilarity. They were all delightful. It's really nice that you can hear the audience noise. Well, not so much. There's one person in there who has a nasty cough, and <laughs> every time they start hacking, it's like, ooh, yikes. <laughs> it's really nice to hear the genuine enjoyment of the enthusiastic audience. You can tell that they're having a blast, and you can tell that the actors are having just as much fun. There are a couple times when they crack, Rochester especially had a, tar had a hard time keeping a straight face in a few scenes, which makes it all the more endearing. <laughs> Some of my favorite parts include anything having to do with Adele. <laughs> She's a puppet, which was brilliant. The puppetry is great, and just every interaction that they had with her was so good. The horse, that was... Excellent, and I'm pretty sure that the horse is played by the same actor who plays John Reed, Brocklehurst, Mason, Adele, Grace Poole, St. John Rivers, the innkeeper, and did I forget anybody? Now, there are a couple parts that are a shade cheeky, a little suggestive. Um, it's just that there are a few times where an actor says a line from the book that can be taken as a double entendre, especially with the way it's said and the way that the actor pauses to glance at the audience. And so there's that. Um, and there's one part that's pretty crass. <laughs> a little bit of toilet humor, literally. The suggestive stuff is not my kind of thing, but there is only a little bit of that, just a few instances. and. The script is not dependent on those kinds of jokes. If it was Jane Eyre but Randy, I would not enjoy it, but this I did enjoy. And so I recommend checking it out if you're up for it and you're in the right mindset and you're looking for a change of pace that is still Jane Eyre, that is a surprisingly well-executed adaptation that stays true to the book. Except for all the stuff that's been added. <laughs> Those are my thoughts on some rare, lesser-known, outlying adaptations of Jane Eyre. As I'm sure you noticed, I had to film this video in segments, and I'm afraid it's turned out to be awfully long. I do apologize for that. This is a busy time of year, and I don't want to distract you from any important business you've got to get done for the holidays, but if you did watch this video all the way to the end, I very much appreciate it, and I want to thank you for taking the time. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Many thanks to those of you who let me know about these various videos. It was very thoughtful, and without you, I would still be out of the loop. <laughs> Links to all the videos and playlists I discussed here can be found in the description. Let me know if you have gotten a chance to see any of these videos and adaptations. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, so go ahead and share those in the comments below. And I'll be back next week I well, I hope to post something on Saturday even if it's just a little video and then my last offering of 2023 will be the blooper reel I'll see you then thanks for watching <laughs>